I was only 18 when it happened. My dad had just broken his arm, and as a construction worker, this put him out of work for a strenuous few months. My mom was just a bartender. She made close to nothing. And even with the mountain of shifts she took on in order to make up the difference, it never helped. By the time we were verging on poverty, I stepped up to the challenge of keeping our family out of the deathly hands of starvation. That was the day I created an account on Craigslist. I'd heard from a couple of friends that the site brought about great work opportunities and would provide me a chance to connect with those employers who were looking for some youthful labor, such as myself. After scanning over a couple ads, some entailing work that needed degrees, others just needed you to be 18 and fit enough to carry heavy objects. But then one ad caught my eye. Farm work, $20 an hour, Ohio, preferred age 18. My eyes lit up at the final part, detailing this was a job I could do. I lived in a nearby state, I would rather not disclose due to personal privacy, but the drive was just long enough so I could afford a coach there. The money I made would be plenty to send home, and I could easily live off a mere $10 a day by eating food from the farm, hopefully without whoever was employing me noticing. I showed the listing to my parents and they were beyond thrilled. Look, Mom, this job could save us, I shouted to her in joy. Oh, Max, I'm so proud of you. We'll get you all packed up, and me and your dad will walk you to the bus station tomorrow. We hugged before going to tell Dad, and his reaction was equally as filled with hope. He sprang off the sofa in joy and exclaimed, Well done, Max. You'll only be there a couple months, I promise, and then I'll be straight back to work and you'll be able to come home. The three of us then got to work packing, checking I had enough clothes, money, food, and water to get there since the journey was a harsh 10-hour drive overnight. We spent the rest of the night talking. Finally, it seemed our family had regained its vitality we had once possessed before Dad's arm broke. We fell asleep on the sofa all together, watching a movie to drift us all to sleep. If I'd only stayed, if I only knew what was to come, I would never have left. The next morning came about, and I grabbed my luggage as we all headed out the door down the road to the bus station. Before entering the bus, I gave my parents one last goodbye hug and stepped onto the bus, waving to them as I departed for the farm. The journey was a long one. Hours upon hours of non-stop empty scenery passed us the further along we got. Two other young-looking people were also on the bus. Were they going to the farm as well? Eventually, the ten hours came to an end, and we clampered off the bus and watched as it parked up at the station, waiting for the next departure around 10 p.m. later that same evening. One of the boys walked in the opposite direction to the farm, whilst me and the girl stayed. You here for the farm job, too? She asked in a plain-sounding Texan accent. The girl stood opposite to me, holding a small bag and a map, slightly dusted with time, but still holding itself together. Her hair was long and black, and she wore jeans and a polka-dotted red and white t-shirt. She was quite attractive. Yeah, job looked as if it paid well and my parents needed the money. I'm Max. She nodded and returned with, I'm Clarissa. Nice to meet you. She grabbed my hand to shake it. Surprisingly, she felt cold to the touch. Quite a shock in the boiling heat of the Ohio sun. After we exchanged names and greetings, we began to make our way up the road towards this massive red barn house. It stood at least 30 feet tall, and you couldn't even fit it all in your vision. It was nearing 9 p.m., so we knocked. And there, opening the door, exposed a man of around 6 feet in height, dressed in clad black. You kids here for the farm work? He said in a grumbled tone, expressing a deep-rooted hatred for youth just by the sound of his voice. Um, yes. Yes, sir. I wanted to make a good first impression so I could get a pay raise as soon as possible. Follow me. This time his voice sounded more serious. Angered, almost, but we followed regardless. The barn was pitch black. He flicked on a torch to see our way through the void of darkness, leading us to the other end of the barn. I looked at Clarissa with a rather nervous look. She ignored it as we approached the back end. Suddenly, the flashlight switched off. Rather bewildered, we called out, Hello? Sir? No reply came. Until all of a sudden, the entire barn lit up with a great blazing light. 
It scorched our retinas as we covered our eyes. But as they slowly regained focus and adjusted to the light, hanging off the beams above were countless human corpses, all seeming to range between the ages of 16 and 17. They all had colossal pieces of flesh lost from their bodies. That's when the booming echo of a shotgun blasted Clarissa directly in the face. Her body thumped to the floor. Her head looked like a newly blossomed flower with pieces of her skull lying about her on the floor. I slowly arched my head upwards, only to see the man who opened the door pointing the shotgun towards me. I reacted instantly. As he clicked the trigger, I moved just enough to have the shotgun take off my entire arm, nearly losing the upper half of my torso instead. The pain was inexplicable, but the adrenaline it gave me allowed me to sprint back out of the barn, with a frustrated shouting coming from behind me as I fled. Get back here, you rat! I want to add you to my collection of vermin! The second blast came, but luckily it missed and hit the door beside me as I flung myself out of the barn. In moments, I'd made it to the station, clambering onto the bus, screaming for the driver to call the police! Just in time, too, the man had followed. But with so many people around, he could do nothing but attempt to flee towards the barn before the police arrived. They came around 30 minutes later, and the sheriffs and the deputies raced up the road towards the barn. Gunfire echoed throughout the town until eventually, the ambulances arrived. The sound of wailing sirens drowned out my screams as they hastily wrapped up my arm and applied buckets worth of antiseptics to try and clean the wound. My arm was gone, but my life was saved. I went home that night. Once in my hometown, I was taken straight to a hospital. A few days later, I woke up from my pathetic state, both physically as well as mentally. My parents were there beside me, bawling their eyes out. They told me that wretched man had been shot dead upon police arrival at the barn. He'd been using that ad for over a year drawing in gullible, desperate, and young people like myself in, to then shoot them, perhaps aiming to fulfill some psychotic need in his head for blood. But since I escaped, he was put down, never to kill anyone again. And as I lay here in bed now, looking at my lost limb, I think to myself, the world is cruel, but people are crueler. I was about 11 years old when my parents divorced. They had absolutely hated each other. They never seemed to stop at the fighting, the arguing, the shouting, and the person who it affected the most was me. My mom managed to win custody over me based on my dad's drinking issues, but we were originally quite poor. So with the loss of half the household income, we should have been in a state of pure poverty. But according to my mom at the time, our luck had turned around. Days after the last papers went through in the final stages of the divorce, my mom met a man called Harry. Harry was incredibly wealthy. I even managed to find out about their relationship. After I saw my mom come home each night wearing a new set of expensive jewelry, and every time I would question her on how she got the money, she would always answer with a shallow grin, then told me to go to bed. Eventually, I was able to meet Harry. We were moving into his house, after all, he was a tall man, about six feet in height, and radiated confidence and wealth alike. His hair was slicked back, and he was always well-dressed. To me, it felt like he was covering for something. His house was a colossal structure, containing several master bedrooms, and was ornately decorated with marble pillars. Though I was always one to notice the cracks. I would point them out, too, only to receive a deathly stare from my mom, followed by an eerie chuckle from Harry. In just a couple of nights, I started growing in my urge to discover who this man really was. Especially as one thing he refused to say continued to haunt me, causing me countless restless nights. I needed to know. The question I repeatedly posed to him was, Where does all your money come from, Harry? To which he would grow a dark glance in appearance, and my mom would retort with, Don't be rude, John. It's inconsiderate to ask people about money. I knew my manners, but I also knew when someone was lying. He would always answer with the same dark glance and ignore it. What was he hiding? 
I began to explore the house, walking around the gleaming corridors at night, attempting to discover the detestable underbelly of this glamorous abode, yet I could never find anything. That was the case at least until one day, whilst clampering past an old painting left on the side of the wall in the corridor, I noticed my steps seemed to echo only when in the area adjacent to the painting. I paced backwards and forward past it, testing if my theory was true, until I decided to take a look behind the painting, which bore an odd resemblance to Harry, and gave an even more extreme facade of true wealth. Lifting the painting up ever so slightly, I noticed a beam of light shining through a rather large gap in the wall. Realizing that suddenly I had found something... What do you think you're doing, Jonathan? A foul voice echoed from behind me as I jumped out of my skin, swerving my head round to see who called for my name. It was one of Harry's butlers. Or, rather, one of his slaves. The butler's face looked wrinkled and bruised in areas, and there came a lifeless aura about his eyes as I spoke to him. Uh, nothing. I saw this painting here and thought I could try lifting it back onto the wall. He nodded, and he grabbed the other end, and in one swift action we lifted it back onto the wall. I thanked him and pretended to move away, only to scuttle back moments later as I heard his steps fade off into the corridor down the other end. I darted back over to the crack, peered through. I felt my body seize up in fright. Through the gap, I was bearing witness to several women, all locked in cages, with camera equipment lodged all over, with their lenses set on the captives. There were countless wounds, scars, bruises that were scattered over their bodies. Their mouths were taped shut, hence why I never heard them before this. The rest of the room was lined with clubs, bats, whips, chains, and a whole assortment of different weaponry, all capable of delivering torture to anyone they could reach. I fell back in shock, and the walls around me felt like they were warping into smiles and grins alike. I was thrown into a state of pure terror, and so I reacted just as any other 11-year-old would have, and sprinted back to my room with tears flooding my eyes. I laid in bed that night, thinking only of the poor, tortured souls that were hidden behind the marble walls and fake smiles. Then, I remembered my mom. I leapt out of bed and threw myself into a full sprint down the corridor to find my mom's room. We needed to get out of there quick before she became a prisoner too. I slowed down as I approached the room, just so Harry wouldn't hear me if he was in there with her. Unfortunately, as I snuck closer towards the bed frame, standing over my mom's empty bed stood Harry, with a bloodied hatchet clutched into his arms. My mind fell into a trance. Did he hit my mom? Did he put her in the cave as well? Was she alive? I could feel nothing aside from all these crazy thoughts running across my mind. It truly pierced me with such a morbid reality that I simply couldn't cope. And as I lost feeling in my legs and hit the floor, I too had just doomed myself to an eternal silencing of my life. Hearing the thud of my back hitting the ground, Harry swiveled round, bearing a demonic smile as he slowly crept up towards me, bearing the hatchet in his arms, raising it high, ready to strike. You know, John, I always wanted a son. The hatchet he was gripping came down on my legs, severing them from my torso. I screamed! But only internally. My body had completely shut down. And although I could feel my veins being lacerated by the metal axe, I could make no attempt to flee. And endurance seemed to be all I had left in this life. He took me to his study. He injected some narcotic into my bloodstream, filling it with a sense of drowsiness. And ever since that day, I've been sewn to this wretched wheelchair. Then been forced to tell the story repeatedly into one of his little cameras that he then sells to vermin like you on the dark web. He'll be here soon. If you're reading, watching, or listening, please stop buying this. Let him end my suffering. I can't go on any longer. Please, help!
I've been dealing with body dysmorphia for around three years now. It started as nothing greater than the average comment giving me a bad day, but it grew inside of me over time into an immeasurable hatred for the body I lived in. School kids would call me names like Fatty McPhee, Burger Boy, Hippo, sometimes even just You're Fat. To them, it was a mere joke, a quick laugh before lesson. The neighbors used to despise me. As per them, I wasn't setting the right example for their kids and the society as a whole. It should have never even started. I just wish they would take it back. Even an apology would have stopped the vines inside my soul from growing. Eventually, it became too late for anyone to take it back. And that was when it truly started. Every night in front of the mirror, I would undress, ready to take a shower. A quick glance in the mirror showed me my body that I was not happy with. I wish I could lose weight, but there was simply no motivation in me to exercise. I was convinced that I would never feel comfortable with myself again. I wanted out. One night while walking into the bedroom with a nervous shiver, I happened to glance at myself in the mirror accidentally. Usually, I would see myself and swiftly shivel my head away. This time, however, it was different. As I stared into the mirror, a pair of eyes that were not my own stared back. A sinister grin widening as I continued to look. The figure in the mirror suddenly opened its mouth as to speak. Then, I heard a voice whisper next to me, Pop the pills. Suddenly, the figure vanished, and I was left shuddering in fear at what that thing was. It seemed my own body in the mirror spoke to me, my real self not matching that of my reflection. It petrified me as I ran out of the bathroom into my bed. I decided I would shower tomorrow in my parents' bathroom. Mine was no longer safe. The next morning arose abruptly as I strained my eyes to stay open without really feeling the effects of yesterday hitting me as much as they should have. That was until I noticed a small box lying on my bedside table. Weight loss pills was inscribed on the front. My mind relapsed into shock. How could they just appear? My mom and dad weren't even aware of my existence, let alone buying me weight loss pills. Logically, they shouldn't be there, and any other reasonable being would most certainly have thrown them away. But the words seemed too enticing to ignore, so I gave in and took my first one the very same morning. After gulping a few down into my gullet, I stumbled towards the bathroom, still drowsy from sleep when the whisper rang out again. Come closer. It beckoned me to the bathroom, and for some foul reason, not of my own mind, I complied. I scampered over to the bathroom with haste, locking the door behind me as I entered its evil grasp. There it was again, but it wasn't me. A fragmented image of the body I had, mixed with the demonic face of another. It spoke once more, in a low, almost disgruntled tone. Take more, it growled. The pills shall hide your fears. They are your comfort. The figure then vanished, and once again, I was looking unhappily at my body that I wished wasn't mine, with a single stream of tears flowing down my cheek. I was so mortified I couldn't move. The tears that poured from my eyes were filled with despair. Not being able to fathom the reality that surrounded me, I was left feeling isolated and at the mercy of whatever demon had taken over my conscience. Days passed by and I got more visions of that creature, telling me to increase the dose. I finished off the first box of 20 in under a week. I thought that by doing what it said, I would escape. It wasn't real. I knew that. At least until a fresh box appeared in the morning after. The pills themselves drastically decreased my energy levels, 
I felt on the verge of succumbing to fatigue at all times of the day, never seeming to catch a break from this agonizing nightmare. Once again, I wanted out. But this time, I wanted to escape this vicious cycle of seeing that evil person in the mirror and these pills. These damned pills. But what petrified me to my very core was the fact that the pills were working. My weight started declining, and in some strange sense, I felt happier. I was able to go outdoors again, only with the negative of being drained, but the poisonous comments stopped. Some who had once been the core of the problem now applauded me at the sudden change of my appearance. Many were shocked to see such a drastic change occur in such a short period of time, but nonetheless, I felt enjoyment bursting through my veins. And then, it all collapsed. Such vast amounts of weight loss were evidently extremely dangerous for my health, both physically and mentally. The figure in the mirror began transforming. In the beginning, it was nothing more than my face that changed but now it seemed to take control over my entire body, feeding at me like some vile parasite that refused to leave me. I was trapped. The final night I saw it, it left me haunting words that I would never be able to forget. Even to this day, I still deal with the shame surrounding my body. It continues to ravage my mind. It was raining thunderbolts outside my house that evening. I had been summoned once more to the bathroom, where that same figure awaited me. The figure had now complete control over my vision, for what stared back at me was my mom. Her hand seemed to grave my shoulder, and she came down close to my reflection's face, then whispered, I have you, hun. Immediately, I was decimated with the realization that there was no figure. It was my mom, hugging me now from behind. Her tears drained down upon my shoulder, and I too started crying. It had been her all along. She had seen me distressed with my own mind, and tried to fix things with a pill. But each night, she supposedly saw me enter the bathroom with a solemn face that wasn't mine. She worried for me every night. She cried for me every day. She just wanted to help me, but she didn't understand how to talk to me about it. Until finally, she came through. Me and my mom have been inseparable since that day. I still struggle with body dysmorphia, but my mom takes away incredible volumes of the agony that comes with it. I feel safe knowing that she is with me. But as for the final night in the bathroom, the words that I have not yet told you came from a dark shadow lurking in the corner. I will find you again. It spoke in a raspy voice. And forever, I shall be wary. Whatever that thing may be, I don't want it to return. I saw them whisk her away with the handcuffs around her wrists. I couldn't resist the urge to follow her, or them. The whispers of the onlookers and those around made me understand that she was arrested for murder. It couldn't be possible. I left her alone for only two weeks. What could have happened? She got into the detective's car and they drove away. Simultaneously, I flew back into my car and traced them. They arrived at the police station in little time. I saw her wince as they dragged her out of the car into the station. I stepped out of my car and followed them. No one questioned me or even seemed to notice me. Everyone was buried in their own business. I wanted to protest and say she, Lucy, had nothing to do with whatever was going on. They led her to the interrogation room, and I followed them and slid into the other side of the room watching them from the glass. Why did you kill him? They struck the first question, and I watched. Lucy didn't respond. She chose silence and stared at her fingers, playing with her nails. The detective sighed. He narrated the scenario, recounting how she moved in with the victim two weeks before. 
My chest stung at those words and breathing became difficult for me. I looked around at those who occupied the room with me and hoped they didn't see the change that occurred. They didn't. Their eyes were fixed on the interrogation going on. I returned my focus to it too. The detective talked about how Lucy lived with the old man, the victim, for exactly two weeks on the night he died. He said she drugged the man with too much sugar. He was a type 1 diabetic. And from the day she moved in, she replaced his insulin shots with supplements. Apart from that, she fed him with calculated amounts of sugar. He concluded that her goal was to make the man hyperglycemic. Of course, when that became bad, he started to develop kidney stones. Rather than take him to the hospital, Lucy just left the man and continued to give him increased shots of the supposed insulin. Of course, the man believed her. She was always his nurse before she became his mistress in those two weeks. Why did you do it? For his inheritance? The man asked Lucy again, and she didn't respond. Her resolve to remain silent was strong. The man stared at her, frustrated. After a while, she raised her head and said, I'll speak only to the head of your department. The detectives interrogating her sighed, and all eyes in the other room were fixed on me. I stared at them for a while before I understood. Of course, I was the head of the criminal department. Of course, that was why no one looked at me or shook when I entered the station. I exited the other side and entered the interrogation room itself. Lucy's face lit up as she saw me. I sized her up and watched the light in her eyes dissipate to fear, and soon after, her face was blank again. I took the seat of the man who was previously asking the questions. He stood at the other side of the room watching the both of us. Tell them I didn't do it, Lucy whispered, and I stared. Her eyes screamed at me to say something, but what was I supposed to say? Did she expect me to tell everyone under me that she was my girlfriend and I trusted her enough not to commit murder? After a while, I simply said, What happened? I nodded my head slightly. Lucy started. She said that her patient, the victim, Mr. Howard, was making advances at her whenever she came for his checkup. She didn't like it, and she didn't know what to do because he was one of her highest paying patients. She said she told her boyfriend. At the mention of the word boyfriend, she looked at me and from her eyes I could tell that she was about to mention my name. I shook my head, making sure the others didn't see and she skipped that part. Her boyfriend told her to ignore the man, but a few weeks later he told her to return his advances because he had a plan. She decided to go with whatever he wanted to do. She got closer to Mr. Howard and started to discover his massive wealth. She told her boyfriend about it, and he sped up the plan. Two weeks ago, he traveled after giving her the new set of insulin, the supplement, and a diet timetable to follow. He also told her to convince the man to bring her into his house for a better access. She moved in with the man as he requested, and followed the timetable her boyfriend gave her strictly. I asked if she knew when she was collecting those things that it would cause harm to her patient, and in the long run, kill him. She hesitated for a while, but nodded. I need your answer in words, Miss Lucy. Yes, she said. You killed him, I said, and she shot me a confused look. I directed my next statement to the detectives, telling them they have the confession they need. She shot up at me, grabbed my sleeve, and screamed in annoyance at how I was supposed to help her. She shouted that this wasn't the plan, but I wasn't interested. I looked towards the detectives and they pulled her away from me and then out of the interrogation room. It was easy to tell that they were taking her to prison. Her case was soon to be in court. She had confessed her crime. I dusted my hands, rearranged my sleeves and walked out of the interrogation room like nothing happened. Of course, a lot had happened, a lot in my favor. I didn't go on vacation like we both planned for her to say or like I reported at the station. I was in that house with her, watching her feed the man with less insulin and more sugar. I got in like the chef I was not and cooked all the food. She simply served him and was the only one in his sight. 
We did it for the money, and someone had to be caught. But it couldn't be me. It could only be her, the nurse that the man trusted. I entered my office and smiled as the report on Lucy's case was brought to my desk. No one could catch me. All evidence pointed at Lucy. Soon, when her psychiatric problems were revealed, no one would believe her words. She wouldn't know or even believe that not only Mr. Howard was drugged, but even her own food was spiked. Spiked with drugs that would tweak her mental system and turn her insane. Her words would not be tenable and only the evidence against her would keep her imprisoned. The inheritance would be mine and mine alone. I forwarded the case to the prosecution office. Bridget went missing first. The morning was bright, oblivious of the impending doom. Helene and I met at the bow after exiting our berths that morning. It was the third day of our vacation. We planned to make a cruise through the ocean for three days and return home after that. We smiled brightly at the sun, waiting for Bridget to join us. Ten, twenty, and thirty minutes passed and we caught not a whiff of Bridget. At first we thought it was because of the mini fight we had the night before. Bridget and Helene had a quarrel about the choice of dinner and at the end of it, she went off to sleep, angry. Helene and I didn't eat either and soon we went off to sleep too. We had planned to meet at the bow every morning since the beginning of the vacation cruise. When we didn't see Bridget after the first hour, our anger dissipated into worry. We started a frantic search of the yacht, trying to make sense of the nonsense that was happening around us. But there was no sign of Bridget. Not in the berths, or conveniences, not with the crew. She was nowhere, and it made no sense. Helene and I sat down, worried after looking through the yacht for close to an hour. We went through her room and bed space, through the box of her belongings. It was still on the yacht. We asked the crew, but no one seemed to know anything of her whereabouts. We were in the middle of the sea with no explanation of where our friend had disappeared. It's your fault! I expected Helene to say it, even before she did. We were back at the bow, heads buried in our hands, terribly wishing that we were playing a complicated form of hide-and-seek. It was better than the reality that was seeming to be true. Bridget was mysteriously missing. I didn't respond to Helene's accusation, but she didn't stop either. It was your idea for us to come to the middle of the sea. What do we do about Bridget? What if we don't find her after today? How do I explain this to everyone? Her parents? My parents? What are we supposed to say? She stood and paced the floor, shooting accusing eyes at me every once in a while. She was right. It was my idea for the three of us to have a cruise in the middle of the sea as part of our summer vacation. We were drifting apart, my friends and I or they were drifting away from me. Bridget joined our class last semester, and she was friends with me first. She was a jovial lady, with a bright smile between her chubby cheeks. Her blonde twisted hair was one of a kind, and it was almost impossible for me to find a fault in her. Almost impossible. Helene had been my best friend forever. Our parents ran the same company, and we were always in each other's houses, one way or the other. When I took a liking to Bridget, I brought her to Helene, and that was where the problem started. Bridget had a way of stealing hearts, and I saw it. I saw her stealing away the heart of my best friend. I saw her draw Helene far away from me, further than I could ever imagine was possible. They hung out together and totally forgot about me. They went shopping. Helene replaced me with her, and I didn't like it. So when summer drew near, I suggested that the three of us take Helene's yacht for a cruise in the middle of the sea. That way, we could bond without any distractions or intrusion. The two of them were mesmerized by the idea. Helene, because she got the chance to spend time with both of her best friends, as she now referred to us, and Bridget, because she'd never been on a yacht and couldn't imagine passing up the chance. I couldn't deny that I was glad when the two of them fought the night before. Of course, I wanted to be friends with both of them, not together, but individually, each to myself. It didn't help if they wanted to be together. I was glad when Bridget excused herself and disappeared to her room. 
I thought Helene and I would have time together, but I was annoyed when she felt bad and decided to go to bed instead. I didn't have a choice but to go in too. What will you do? Helene's teary voice drew me out of my thoughts. I shrugged. I didn't know what to say. You know what? I'll tell the crew to turn back now and take us back to shore. We need to find Bridget. She turned away and I watched her go. A couple of minutes later, the yacht changed direction and headed back home. I hated the direction our vacation was headed. Two hours later, there was a terrible storm and we had to stay in our berths. It was late in the evening before the storm was over and I returned to the bow. The chef had prepared dinner. I told him to get Helene, assuming that she was angry and that's why she hadn't shown up yet. When the chef came back, his eyes were filled with horror, and I knew the news even before he told me. Helene was missing. Another frantic search began. Of course, what was the sense of two people missing in the middle of a sea? There were no traces of blood or struggle. They were just gone. The crew increased their speed, and by dawn we were back at shore. There, two human bodies and some detectives awaited me. Before I could say a word, handcuffs clipped my wrists and I was dragged away from the yacht. I would have forever wondered how they figured out that I pushed Bridget and Helene over the edge. But the mystery was solved during the interrogation when a video of all I did to both my friends, betrayers, on the sea was played. How could I have known that there was a secret CCTV camera somewhere around the bow or in the berths? I was too foolish to remember that Helene's parents were rich enough to install them and watch as I lured Bridget from her room after the argument with Helene. How I led her to the bow in a pretense of trying to appease her. How I pushed her over the edge and smiled with adoration at my accomplishment. It was supposed to be a clean crime. That same camera watched me push Helene too during the storm. I didn't intend to, but she acted too quickly about Bridget and I didn't like it. The crazy storm pushed both bodies to the shore right before the yacht arrived. The detectives were notified by the crew who had watched the playback after the storm. They sent the video to the detectives who arrived in time to see the bodies and wait for the yacht. Bridget and Helene deserved it for wanting to replace me with one another. I should have been their only friend. My name is Douglas. I'm 53 years old. I have a small shop in which I sell sportswear. Clothes, sports shoes, also some bodybuilding items. Last year during Black Friday, I also took the chance to make some good business, which was precisely what happened. I was very happy with the outcome. Great profit was made, especially because we sold products that were already waiting too long to be bought. Back then I had two employees, Dexter and Marcello. They were both excellent professionals. I also had a wife, Prudence, who was 10 years younger than me. When I arrived home after that busy Friday, I was tired, but happy to speak to my wife. It was a success. Lots of work, but totally worth it, I said to her. I'm glad to hear that, honey. Now finish your late dinner and then let's go to bed. You need your rest, my wife said. That's the best idea I heard all day, I replied, finishing the fine meal that Prudence had prepared for me. The next day when I woke up, it was already three in the afternoon. Of course, our shop was closed, and obviously my wife wasn't in bed with me. For sure, her day started a lot earlier. I was just glad that she kept quiet and didn't wake me up. I definitely needed that extra rest. I went to the bathroom to take a shower, I shaved and brushed my teeth. When I got out of the bathroom, I noticed the house was still very silent. I realized my wife wasn't home. She went out and didn't return yet. Nothing strange, I thought to myself, as I prepared myself a cup of coffee. What was odd was the fact that the newspaper was nowhere to be seen. This was something unusual. I called Prudence to check on her. Her cell phone was off. When it was already 10 p.m., my wife was still away, and I tried to phone several times already. Worried, I went to the police. There wasn't much that I could tell them, just a classic case of a missing person. Did you try calling the hospitals nearby, her friends, relatives, co-workers? The police asked me the usual questions. Actually, not really. It didn't even cross my mind, I answered. Do so, please. Keep in touch within the next 48 hours, Mr. Murray. 
If your wife's still missing, we'll then open a file on her and start an investigation, they replied. It seemed fair enough. That night I called several hospitals, not just from our area. I also called everyone that I could think of that knew Prudence. Since my wife didn't work outside home, she had no co-workers or bosses that I could contact. No one had seen Prudence since the last 24 hours. More days went by, and my wife was now officially a missing person. We didn't have any sons or daughters, so I was now dealing with her disappearance on my own. But, show must go on, right? This meant I had to get back to my shop. The fact that I was the boss and the owner didn't allow me to take time off, especially after that profitable Black Friday. There was a lot of work to do. I also told my employees Dex and Marcello about what happened. They were very supportive. I'm very sorry to hear about that, Mr. Murray. I don't really know what to say, Dexter said. If the authorities are already working on the case, the best thing to do is wait and pray, Marcello replied. I thank them both. My hopes were not very high, though. Nevertheless, I was still going to receive some unexpected news, and definitely not the kind that I wished for. During the next week, I went to the bank. I was stunned when I found out that half of my savings were missing. Already under enormous pressure, I made quite a scene. What is this? I was robbed! I demand an explanation! Within a few moments, I was now speaking to the manager in his own office. Mr. Murray, I'm very sorry, but your wife just came here last week and she simply took that money with her. Cash. Both y'all allowed to move that money, as you must remember. Mrs. Murray said that you were going through a lot of work and needed that money to pay some additional bills, and that you were also going to open up a new shop. I didn't ask any questions since both of you are our clients for 20 years now. When I heard those words, I snapped. Just too much. I didn't hurt the bank manager, but I destroyed his office while screaming like a maniac. Of course, security was called. And then the police too, as I was taken under custody. Not for long though. Next day I was out of jail. The authorities were very comprehensive, and the bank's manager as well. My wife was now being pursued as a criminal who was missing. In all, she had taken $60,000 with her. Money that I needed to keep the business flowing. The half that I still had wasn't enough. Also because I needed it for my own personal expenses. Health insurance, houses, we had two, cars, etc. I had to let one of my employees go. Don't worry, Mr. Murray, you can let me go. Dexter needs the job more than I do. I mean, he's older, I'm young, and I was thinking of going back to my country anyway, Marcello said. He was a Colombian citizen. Thank you for understanding, Marcello. I'm sorry. It was great working with you. You're a good man and you will be missed. Best of luck, I said. At least this decision made it easy for me. I sold my houses and bought an apartment. I also sold my cars, which were expensive, and got a modest one. Step by step, I was able to pull myself together. But as time passed, I got super obsessed with the idea of finding my wife. Tired of waiting for the police to give me answers, I hired a private investigator. A woman, actually, named Joanne Moon. And within three months, I was summoned to Joanne's office. I have something to show you, she said on the phone. Burning with excitement and curiosity, in less than one hour, I was in Joanne Moon's office. We found our wife. And her friend. You can see for yourself, Mr. Murray, Joanne said as she showed me a collection of pictures. I didn't even say a word when I saw what and who was in the pictures. My wife, smiling and having fun on the beach, but she wasn't alone. Marcello was with her. In some pictures, they were kissing and holding each other. I understood immediately what had happened. I felt stupid and betrayed. The American police was informed of all this, but since Prudence and Marcello are living in Colombia, my only hope is for them to return to the United States so that they can be brought to justice. Unless I travel there, take justice in my own hands. My name is Leo Trudeau, and I'm 52 years old. I have my own import-export company. I buy products from foreign countries to sell them here in the United States, and the other way around as well. Being a businessman is also an addiction, to me at least. 
So I also like to buy and sell used items on the internet. Not under my company, but simply on my own. As Leo, the common individual. I have several ads running on different online platforms. At one occasion, I was contacted by someone who was interested in a video game console that I was selling on Craigslist. An Atari Jaguar, mid-90s, a little bit of an underground system. It's definitely a collector's item these days. I was selling the console with the original box, plus a few games included, which made the price tag go up to $450. So, I was happy to know that I was going to sell the Atari Jaguar. After exchanging a couple of emails with the person, Luke Lee, one phone call sealed the deal. I'm very excited about buying the Jaguar. From the pictures, I could say that it's in great condition and functioning properly as well, since you were kind enough to display footage of the system working. Being a retro video game collector, the fact that the full box is included makes a big difference, Luke said. Given the sound of his voice, it appeared that he was a young man, no older than 25 years old, give or take. He was, in fact, very talkative, asking me about old video games in general, but also 80s and 90s pop culture. I found him to be nice and somehow amusing as an individual, but I just wanted to get the business closed. And so we decided to meet the next day. He gave me his address. Luke told me that he didn't drive. That being the case, it made sense that I was taking the console and the games to his house. It was still a relatively big package, too big and still valuable enough for someone to carry it on foot or through public transportation. Less than 24 hours later, around 6 p.m., I arrived at Luke's house. It was a nice place on the suburbs. I assumed that he still lived with his parents, and that he probably didn't want them to know about their son spending almost $500 on a 90s video game console. Fine by me. I just wanted to get the money and make the kid happy with his Atari. As I parked the car, Luke immediately came out of his house, even before I called him. He was probably waiting at the window. He actually looked younger than 25 years old, but appearances can be misleading. Luke was wearing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle t-shirt, and he had short red hair and freckles. No signs of facial hair whatsoever, not even a shaved beard. He was wearing an enormous pair of glasses. He was smiling at me as if I was Santa Claus himself bringing a gift from his dreams. Hello, Mr. Trudeau. I'm glad you're here, he said as we shook hands. Uh, hello, Luke. Ah, uh, so here it is, the good old Jaguar. I bet most of your friends never played Doom on the Jaguar. For sure you'll impress them, I said, taking the package from my car's trunk. Uh, I don't really have friends, to be honest. Would you mind bringing the console into my house and helping me set it up? Luke asked. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, no trouble at all, I replied, being sincere. Luke seemed to be happy with my answer. I followed him into the house. After getting in, I assumed Luke's parents were out on vacation because the house was a complete mess and smelled bad. Uh, I see you're home alone these days, Luke. But uh, really, if you don't mind taking my friendly advice from a grown-up, try to clean up every once in a while. You never know. Your parents may pop up by surprise. I said, trying to be nice and concerned even. Oh, don't mind about that, Mr. Trudeau. I live here alone. My parents died a few years ago. Boat accident. They were never really there for me, but had tons of money, which I inherited, along with other things, like the house. I guess I should hire a housekeeper then. Uh, thank you for the advice, Mr. Trudeau, Luke said with a childish smile on his lips. As we finally entered, I, what I assume was his gaming room. I set up the Atari Jaguar for him. Within a few minutes, the console was ready to be played. Thank you so much, Mr. Trudeau. Here's the money. By the way, before you go, won't you play with me for just five minutes or so? As I said, I don't really have any friends. No brothers or sisters or parents, Luke said. Feeling sorry for the kid, I said... Uh, Sure, uh, but only for a few minutes. I, I gotta go. By the way, how old are you, Luke? I asked. I just turned 17, he answered. After 20 minutes, 
I decided it was time to go. I had done my good deed for the day. I was sad for the kid, but I wasn't his father. But the kid himself had a different idea. Luke insisted he wanted to walk me to my car. And when I shook his hand and said goodbye, Luke asked, Mr. Trudeau, will you be my adoptive father? You don't need to support me or anything. Just visit me once or twice every week. Maybe spend the weekend now and then. We could do things together. Go out for dinner, movies, play video games together. Didn't you enjoy spending the last hour with me? Okay, now I was getting freaked out. I could see Luke's green eyes behind his glasses looking at me with expectation. Listen, Luke, I think you should go and talk to someone. Therapy, maybe. For sure, in school, someone can help you. I wish you all the best, but I'm not your father, kid. And you're 17 years old already. You'll be a grown-up man soon enough. It's time to grow up. But it's hard. But it'll be worth it. Take care. I said to Luke before driving back to my place. That same night, I woke up. My cell phone was ringing. It was Luke. The young man was clearly drunk or high and crying. He was begging me to become his adoptive father. My wife, Janice, was sleeping next to me, and she also woke up with Luke's sobbing screams. I terminated the phone call and explained to Janice what was happening. Unbelievable. You never know what kind of prank life is preparing, Janice said. I had to agree with her. Luke insisted and continued to harass me for the next few days. He even started calling me dad. Alarmed, I was forced to call the authorities and get a lawyer. For now, this seems to have worked, but the situation is still very disturbing to me. I hope Luke leaves both me and my wife alone and gets the help he needs. My name is Roger, and I am 44 years old now. I used to be a soccer player on a professional level. I even played in Europe for a while. I was smart and responsible enough to save and invest enough money so that I could have a comfortable life after retirement, which in this kind of job happens very soon. I kicked my last official ball when I was 41. This was only one year after me and my wife got divorced. We were happy enough, but sometimes things end when they end. Plus, we had a son, Andy. Since I was retiring so young, and my wife Phoebe, who was only 32, still had many plans and goals to pursue in life, it was decided that Andy would live with me. In spite the usual visitations and vacations with his mother, etc., the usual deal. I had money, I was young enough, and I was retired. But I had a son, and I was going to raise him at least for the most part, by myself. Andy was nine years old by that time. Back then, we lived in an apartment. Big and pleasant enough, but I thought that it was time to move on, leave the past behind. Me and my son needed new memories, and what better place to start another chapter than in a new house? After a couple months of searching, we finally found a house that pleased us both, father and son. It had two floors and it was close to the beach. Dad, I love it here, my son said in his first night, when I was kissing him goodnight after he went to bed. I'm glad you do, Andy. I think we made a great choice. We'll be very happy here. Sleep tight, son. Pleasant dreams, I replied before turning off the lights. After one month, though, I soon realized that I needed someone to help me with all the endless domestic tasks. I had time, but I definitely didn't have the skills or experience. I decided to hire a housekeeper, who would be in our house eight hours per day, like a normal daily job. I interviewed quite a few women across all ages. There was one, however, that was particularly nice and had experience with children. She was a Russian immigrant named Svetlana. Your references are very good, Svetlana, especially for someone so young, 28 years old, I said. Thank you, mister. I came to the United States when I was 23 and already had worked in Western Europe, 
as a full-time housekeeper. I also took care of children and even elderly people, the young woman answered. Andy seemed to like her a lot, even since that first meetup. Svetlana did have one of those empathic personalities. It was easy to understand how she was good with people and children in particular. Her English was also very good. Very well, thank you for coming. I will contact you within the next week whether I'm interested in your services or not. I never leave people without an answer, I said, being sincere. Thank you, sir. That's good to know. I will be waiting for your word then, she said, before leaving. As expected, it wasn't hard to make the decision. Andy also agreed that Svetlana appeared to be a great choice. She's very beautiful, Dad. I can't wait until my friends see her. When she takes me to school or when they come here to play with me, Andy said. Boys will be boys, I thought, with a smile. Within two weeks, Svetlana was working in our house. She quickly adapted, as did we. She arrived in the morning and would prepare breakfast. Then sometimes she would take Andy to school, while other days, I made it my job to take him. Svetlana would return in the afternoon and do all sorts of chores. She would also go shopping and she cooked. By the time she left at 5 p.m., everything was perfect. I just had to heat dinner a couple of hours later. And of course, usually on the weekends, she had her days off, but sometimes we would change her schedule. Months passed by and everything was perfect. Me and Andy were happy, also going out a lot, dinner, movies, etc. We also visited my ex-wife, Phoebe, who was living and working in another state. You both seem to be doing great. I'm almost jealous of that Svetlana. I can't wait to meet her. And also your new house. Through the pictures, I can already tell I'll definitely like it, Phoebe said. Eventually, I started dating other women. Svetlana would stay home with Andy during those few nights. This only happened once a week. I was paying her for the extra hours, of course. And since she was still single and didn't have her family in the United States, she didn't mind. It was now one year since Svetlana came to work in our house. I needed a special favor from our housekeeper. I wanted to go out for a whole weekend. I was dating a woman for a while and I wanted to take things to another level. It's just for two days, Svetlana. I'll leave on Friday and come back on Sunday in the afternoon. You can have Monday and Tuesday off, I said. Very well, mister. I'm happy to help and I enjoy spending time with little Andy, she replied. And so it was arranged. I had a great time in that weekend with my girlfriend, Daphne. When I returned home Sunday, I was even excited about the idea of talking to Andy about her and to arrange for them to meet. No one was home. I assumed they had gone for a walk. It was still relatively early, but after a couple of hours, I was starting to worry, and I called Svetlana's cell phone. It was turned off. My son also had one. I called Andy. It was also turned off. I panicked and contacted the police and answered all their questions. Svetlana was now being persecuted by the authorities. Three months later, there was no sign of Svetlana. But my son, Andy, was found dead, ironically on a beach. For some morbid yet logical reason, it was an outcome that I was expecting. With grief in my heart, I had to contact my ex-wife, who now hated me from the core of her heart. That day I got a call from the police. They had found some vital information regarding my son. I hurried off to the station. I'm afraid we have some very disturbing information. Please sit down, the detective said as I sat down in front of him in his office. We conducted an autopsy, of course, and we made a gruesome discovery. Some of your son's internal organs were removed, including the heart and the two kidneys. It's a safe assumption that your housekeeper is a part of an organ trafficking organization, and after gaining your trust, she waited patiently for the right moment to act. I'm sorry. We will keep looking for her, Hopefully, at least, we can bring her to justice sooner or later. I couldn't even react properly to the detective's words. I still can't. My ashes. Take them to the most northern region of my homeland. The Isle of Man. Bury them. Protect them. Goodbye, Felix. January 1994. 
Tuesday at 12 p.m. That was the exact year, month, date, and time my mom passed from cancer. She had been fighting it for over four years, with multiple cases of her verging on death, but never breaking the boundary. She was the only person who had ever cared for me after dad died when I was still in the womb. And now she was gone, and nothing left but an urn filled with her ashes. After years and years devoted to raising me, nurturing me into an adult, I felt a duty to my mom to deliver her final wish, to be buried on the Isle of Man. The request seemed rather strange to me as I had no recollection of why she would want her ashes left to rest there, but that was her wish and I was gonna see it through. I left early a couple weeks after she passed on a ferry that took me there in just a few hours. The trip was serene and calm. It felt as if nature guided my way to her grave, if only. I stepped onto the port of the Northern Territory of the Isle, where the coastal village sat, overlooking the great expanse of water disconnecting it from mainland Britain. It took around 15 minutes for me to reach the peak of the hill, looking down upon the village. I thought that this would suit her, a resting place high above the world, reaching out its hands to the heavens where I knew she was watching me from. I missed her, and tears rolled down my cheeks unstoppably as I dug her grave. In moments, I had created a gap in the ground to store her remains, or rather preserve them for God's judgment, as I said my final goodbyes and walked towards the village to find somewhere to stay. The village was extremely quiet, with the only lit window being that of a local inn where I found a warm bed to rest in, for a rather unique price, if anything. Breaking away from the expensive hotels back in Portsmouth, the town I lived in at the time. As I lay in bed, I drifted off into a false reality of conscience that tricked my mind into thinking about the day that had passed. Looking back on the burial procedure, it was indeed odd that so many from the village had been stopping and gasping at the sight of me tearing a hole into some random hill that lay beside them. Yet, as I walked into the village, not a single head turned. How peculiar, I thought. These recent memories soon faded from my mind, and eventually I was submerged in sleep, and my mind found a new reality to live in for the short time I had escaped mine for. I woke abruptly the next morning to a loud bang. Someone had slammed my door. I sprung out of bed and sprinted over to it, flung it open to see a man, likely to be the one responsible, running down the hallway, down the stairs. Luckily, I had slept in my day clothes, and it took me mere moments to shove my feet into my shoes and trail the sicko to find out what he was doing in my room while I was asleep. I ran downstairs with haste, only to see him escape through the lobby door. I called for someone to stop him, but it must have been quite early in the morning, as there wasn't a single soul sitting on the sofas nor behind the counter. I took it upon myself to catch him, and I followed him through the door and out onto the street. The sun beamed its agonizing rays into my eyes as I exited the inn, exposing me to the fact that it was more along the lines of midday. This was strange to me. I had never woken up later than eight, even on the weekends. How on earth did I sleep until midday? I soon disregarded this thought as I saw the white outline of the same man sprinting into the doors of what appeared to be the village hall. Was he trying to hide from me? I swiftly made my way into that same building and carefully pushed open the doors, opening it up to a room filled to the brim with what seemed like the whole town dressed in white and blue cloaks. I froze in abject terror, and before I could close the doors to escape, I was dragged into the middle of the room by some men and was sent to my knees in front of a woman dressed in a quilted amethyst fabric with her hood covering her eyes. But holding in her hands was none other than my mom's urn, covered in dirt. What is this? I yelled. Do not speak. Now. Open your ears. You have so much to hear. She spoke in a low, tenured vocal and was instantly enthralled to perk my ears to her words. Felix, you have finally been caught. We never intended for you to hear this, but the time has come. Years ago, when you were still in your mother's womb, she snapped one day. 
It was at our local school where she was teaching a class when something in her head broke down. She rampaged the entire room. Though all the children escaped, when your father came to see what was wrong, she drove a chair leg through his skull and smiled. We recognized her mental state was zombified in nature by the cancer. So we chose to banish her instead of doing this, which we should have done so long ago. This is what killers deserve, Felix. We do, however, recognize that you did not play a part in her evil, so we will let you leave. But let this be a warning to you, Felix. Never return. And with that, I was allowed to leave. My mind couldn't even fathom what had just happened. I used my lighter to give myself a cigarette as I locked the doors to the village hall behind me, using a plank of wood nearby. They were lying. My mom could never have done that. I then started to hold my lighter under the wooden planks lining the exterior to the building. They just destroyed my mom's final wish. How could they? The flames soon caught the wood, and in moments, the entire building was set ablaze. And if they wanted to treat some poor cancer patient's ashes with such brutal disrespect and lies, then they shall become ashes themselves. I watched as the building was finally engulfed in flames. Black plumes of smoke bellowed into the sky above, with screams echoing the void of shadow. They would all pay. Mom would be so proud. I walked down the narrow and empty street as I hummed myself quietly. It was a dark evening, the street lights weren't on yet, but my house wasn't too far, so I decided to walk. I tried not to acknowledge the looming feeling over my shoulder, and I turned on my phone flash. I decided against looking behind me, and picked up the pace now more determined than ever to get home. Doll. I heard a voice call behind me, and I froze in my tracks. My blood ran cold. He found me. I suddenly looked and whipped my head back, but didn't see anyone. Although the dreadful feeling had already settled in me, I continued my journey home, now running as fast as I could. I quickly unlocked my front door and went inside, shut it, locking it behind me. My breath came out in short, heavy pants, and I struggled to even out my breathing. I filled up a cup of water and drank it, all while my beating heart subsided. I shook my head and had to clear my thoughts. It couldn't possibly be him. He couldn't have found me. I must have been hearing things. I tried to convince myself that it was all a figment of my imagination, till my eyes caught something I'm sure wasn't there previously. I slowly moved towards my sturdy table my eyes fixed on a strange object. A bottle of pills. I read the note attached to the bottle of pills left on my table. Daw, I see you've been slacking on your medication. You've been looking quite pudgy lately. Be a good doll and take these for me till I return. Four in the morning, four at night. I'm sure you remember what happens if you're a bad doll. My heart was racing by the time I finished reading. Oh, no, 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 no. It can't be. I ripped the note apart and threw the bottle of weight loss pills to the ground. I screamed, tears filling my eyes. How did he find me? How did he get in? I sobbed and slid my back against the wall till I hit the floor. It had been a week since then. I refused to leave my house for fear that he'd take me. I couldn't sleep. I'd have nightmares of him coming back and shoving the pills down my throat. I'd even sometimes feel him lurk around the dark corners of the house. 
I laid on my bed and stared at the bottle of weight loss pills that now sat on my bedside table. I had placed them back there. Who knew that psycho monster was monitoring my every move? Perhaps through a hidden camera in my room? This was pathetic. My condition was pathetic. I had to do something, I thought to myself. I got up and reached for it, clenched the bottle of pills tightly in my shaky hands. I went to the bathroom and lifted the toilet seat. With a set mind, I dumped the contents of the bottle into the toilet and flushed. I almost let out a sigh of relief when I heard the rattle of the door handle. He was here. My heart sunk into the pit of my stomach and I contemplated ending it all right here, but no. I got away from him once and I could do it again. I ran back to the bedroom and quickly grabbed my phone, sending an emergency text to my boss and informed him to help me out somehow. Over the past few months, he had become my pillar of support. The monster's heavy footsteps echoed through the house and my body trembled in fear. I sat still like a doll at the edge of my bed, just as he taught me to. My heart beat faster with every footstep, and I looked straight ahead, not daring to look back as he came in. The squeak of the door to my room opening announced his presence, and I kept my face completely emotionless as he liked. My pretty doll, he said as he stood beside me. I stayed as still as I could, the pungent smell of alcohol from his breath hitting my nostrils. I nearly gagged as he bent beside me, sniffing my hair, licked the skin of my cheek, letting out a sound of satisfaction. He pet my hair slowly, then gave it a harsh tug, which caused me to let out a hiss I immediately regretted. I I'm sorry I moved. I immediately started begging, the tears falling down my eyes fast. He frowned and shook his head aggressively. Why is my pretty doll crying? Dolls don't cry. <laughs> I nodded my head quickly and got back into position, but the tears didn't stop rolling down my cheeks. He yelled at me to stop crying and smacked my face with the back of his hand hard. Due to the massive impact, I fell on the bed. I touched my bottom lip, which was bruised from his knuckle ring, and I winced. Your face is all fat. You haven't been taking your medication, have you? He yanked my head up as he spoke and spat in my face. I lied that I finished it. My mind instantly went to the empty pill bottle I left on the bathroom floor. I prayed in my head silently that he wouldn't discover it. Liar! He yelled once again and held my face tight in his hands. Why are you so bad? Dolls aren't bad. You used to be my perfect little doll, and now you're all fat. He pinched and dragged my cheeks and arms while he spoke. He mumbled to himself as he reached into his back pocket and pulled out an identical pill bottle that he had given me earlier. I shook my head vigorously. No, please, no. I pleaded, but he ignored me and held the back of my head tightly, fisting my hair. He ripped the bottle open with his teeth and poured a handful of the pills into his free hand. I scratched at the hand holding my head and squirmed, trying to free myself from his grasp. I screamed at the top of my lungs, hoping someone, somewhere would hear me and come to help but he used that as an opportunity to dump the handful of pills into my mouth. He closed my mouth shut and with his hand shook me and attempted to force me to swallow them. I choked and fought with all my might, but he held down on my neck, trying to get me to give in. I began seeing spots in my vision. I was too weak to continue resisting, just as I was about to give up. My door was busted off its hinges 
and policemen flocked into my room. My tormentor was instantly taken off me. I felt my body heave as I cough and spat out the pills and a protective arm wrapped around me. You're okay. Everything's okay. You're safe now. The owner of the arm said. I looked up with blurry eyes and I identified him to be my boss. I finally sighed in relief and watched as the police detained him and took him away. He was charged and found guilty of his crimes. That was the final time I saw him. I started my life anew and in a new city without fear of my father ever coming back. My friends invited me to a party, and even though I didn't feel so into it, I couldn't decline their invitation. The three of them, Sam, Diana, and Pinky, were starting to think I was avoiding them. If I wanted to clear up the misunderstanding, I didn't have a choice but to follow them wherever they wanted me to go. Or maybe I had a choice, and I wanted out like they were suggesting. The party was held at a clubhouse. Sometimes I wondered if I was avoiding the three of them on purpose like they supposed I was, because no matter what they did, I was never pleased. I couldn't tell if they were the selfish ones or if I was. They knew I was not a lover of night outings, especially if all roads led to a clubhouse, yet they were asking me to go with them to one. I hated the smell of booze and sweat. I didn't particularly fancy dancing and every other thing that happened at such parties, but they claimed that they were bringing me out to get out of my shell, helping me live my best life. If I was being honest with myself, the best life was the one without them, one that I could live in the confines of my rundown room, the only thing my mother who died of cancer a few months ago handed over to me. Or maybe it wasn't, but how could I tell? I was getting more used to being alone than being with them. I couldn't blame my friends, they probably thought my mother's death was starting to throw me into a state of depression. And I was thinking so too. They probably thought I was losing my mind, and I would die slowly if they left me in the confines of that room. For their sake, as well as mine, that night at the party, I loosened up and allowed myself to feel whatever they felt whenever they were at those parties. I wouldn't know what it was that they felt, but after a few minutes on the dance floor, I was stripped of whatever worries I carried along with me to the party. The music flooded my head and swept through my body in a mesmerizing manner. The feeling was the opposite of the comfort my room gave me. It wasn't quiet or eerie. The clubhouse didn't smell like a rotting body or dampness, but it eased my soul and gave way to a sort of freedom that I'd never felt before. Suddenly, I wondered why I'd never tried it before. I didn't like parties still, but I loved that one in particular, especially when a hot looking guy stood dancing by my side, obviously seeking my attention. My hands found their way to his biceps, tracing his chiseled body and the weakness of my knees led me to dance with him. His hands were all over me and I didn't care. I loved the idea of someone being interested in me. I glanced over at my friends where they sat watching me shake my body all over. <laughs> they smiled at me in amusement, wowed by the level of craziness I was displaying. It wasn't long before the guy pulled me out of the dance floor and we sat in a booth. We ordered some wine and <laughs> I didn't have any energy to decline. Something was enchanting about the way he spoke, the way he stared into my eyes the way he held my hands and filled my glass with wine. When he pushed my glass into my hand, I brought it to my mouth and emptied it in one gulp. The clubhouse was no longer noisy, and it was just myself and the guy. I was starting to relish the night's party. At that stage, I thought perhaps my friends were right, and I needed some freedom. If only I knew that the alcohol was just messing with my head. The man asked if I would like to follow him to his house, or if I would rather take him to mine. I shook my head and responded that my mother would kill me if I brought a man home to my house for a one-night stand. 
He chuckled and whispered into my ear that he knew that I was living alone. Tingles spread through my veins and butterflies rumpled up my stomach. I was mesmerized by his voice and whispers. I didn't know when I let him out of the clubhouse and when we were headed to my house. I led him into my room, not caring that it wasn't in the right state or presentable enough. My neighbor saw me enter the house, and I thought I saw a twinge of irritation in her eyes, but (laughs) I didn't care. My mother was gone, and no one had the right to mother me or watch whatever I did. I was living alone, after all. My young man didn't seem to care either, because soon we were in each other's arms, the place where I had the best night of my life since my mother died. The shock, however, came the next morning when I woke up, conscious and aware of the pleasure I had the previous night. Except that the situation around me didn't match up with the thoughts in my head. I was fully clothed in my party dress. It wasn't scattered around the room as I imagined. Was it possible for a person to redress after a night of pleasure? The house also held no sign of a visitor, or that I slept with a man in the same house. It was clean and neat, not messy as I imagined before bringing him into the house. I checked around the house and saw nothing. It crept me out even more because I lived alone and there was no one to ask about his whereabouts. My heart sped in different directions as I tried to make some sense of what was going on. I decided to turn to the only person that I knew that could have an answer, my neighbor. I stepped out of my house and came in contact with the same woman I saw the previous night when I came with my visitor. Despite my embarrassment, I asked if she saw him leaving that morning, but and said that I didn't come home with anyone, that I was alone. I thought she was trying to scare the wits out of me until I called Sam and he said the same. I left the club by myself after ordering three bottles of wine and drinking them in large gulps. They tried to stop me to call a cab and help me, but I pushed them away and disappeared into the night. They were worried, but they figured I would get home safe nonetheless. I would never understand if my handsome guy was imagined or real. Sometimes I blame it on the alcohol. Other times I conclude that it was only a silly dream as a result of a disorienting night and whatever happened in my mind going through another routine. Either way, I will never go to night parties anymore. Neither will I have a taste of any form of alcohol. My family moved to a new city and to a new house. Mom was the giddiest about our move, and she often spoke about how much of a steal we got our house for. I wondered why we had to steal a house to live in it, But I never asked anyone, and I suspected that no one would listen to me anyway. But I heard my dad tell my mom that the old family who had lived in the house had passed away in a fire. The last family had been there all but three days. No one else but my family would touch the property, as it was cheap. Dad called it an unfortunate string of incidents, because no one had suspected of arson. Dad swore to be careful and mom assured. I was pleased with the house because it was big and I had a bigger room in the new house than I did in our old house. The house creaked when you walked on it and I liked to walk on it because the noise made me happy. We had a big backyard, twice the size of our old house at least, and I could afford to bring my friends over to play, my mom said. I missed my old friends as I was all alone when we had to move from our old neighborhood. The old neighborhood was too far away from any of my friends to visit us, and I was new in this neighborhood, so I didn't have any friends to play with. Mom said I would have no trouble finding friends because we had a beautiful new house. She said it would be a surprise. In our first week in the house, I found a friend in my room. He had the most curious eyes, and he was as tall as I was. His arms were bigger, and he walked around with a stocky stride. I sensed that he was short, but I didn't know many short people. He was dressed in a fanciful black shirt that could easily blend in with the night, and he stayed quiet as I walked into my room with my toys in my hand. Hello there, he said to me. He was seated on the floor where my toys were. 
but I saw that he didn't touch any of them as they had been left the same way from where I had left them. He asked me what my name was and I told him my name, Richard. He said it was a beautiful name for a handsome little boy like me. Are you my friend? I asked him, smacking my lips to think that my mom had brought a new friend for me to play with. Your friend? His curious eyes darted in the orbs and his lips trembled with an answer which I willed to be positive. My mom said I would get a new friend. Did mom ask you to come play with me? I asked sternly as I seized a long inhalation to catch myself. Oh, yes, he stammered without hesitation, and he brought himself up from his kneeling position and started to walk to me. I asked him for his name, and he said it was Donald. Donald was not five years old. He had the type of hair that Dad had on his face. Donald was nice to me, and he smiled when he walked to me. Would you like to play with my toy? I said, offering my hands out to him in charity. His hazel eyes fell onto me with a flatness, but I wasn't afraid. He was not taller than me, and he was nice. Sure. Where are your parents? He asked and grabbed my squishy toy. He held it up to his nose and sniffed it. Then he stuffed it into his mouth and bit into it. Upstairs, ready to go to bed. Hey, careful, I squealed. Honey, Mom called from across the hallway where the bedroom was. What's going on in there? Donald looked into my eyes and shook his head. His lips moved and he said to me softly, I am fine, Mom, he dictated to me. I'm fine, Mom, I said it back to her. All right, sweetie, go to bed. It's your first day of school tomorrow, Mom votes from across the hallway. Do you want to play a fun game? Donald said to me, rolling my toy on his fingertips. My innocent five-year-old eyes trained on the toy as it struck the floor and chirped noisily. Donald placed his calloused hands on my face and guided my attention back to himself. It's nighttime, and Mom says I have a day at school tomorrow. Will you come with me to school tomorrow? I asked. We're friends now, aren't we? Would you not want to play with your new friend? Donald asked me, and I was convinced. My eyes glowed, betraying my simpleness, and he smiled. What game? I have toys, I said. He shook his head and put his hands out. I looked into his hands and my face flushed with nervousness. I chugged on my saliva in my tiny throat. He outstretched his hand and insisted. Then I took it. When my hand was in his, Donald said nothing, and he walked me to the door of my room and looked at me. I took the cue and I reached out my idle hand to pull over the hinge. The door opened quietly, and Donald pulled me in after himself. His march was brisk, hurried, and I had no idea why he was walking so quickly until we got to the end of the hallway. It struck me that my new friend knew all about our house, but I insufficiently articulated the comment anyway. This is my house, and nobody gets to keep it but me he said nonchalantly as he moved blindly into the direction of the kitchen, guiding me after him, and my stomach roared with appetite. I assured he needed food, and he asked me, Turn on this one. I placed my hand on the black knob of Mom's cooker, and it snapped in the direction that he insisted. The surface fizzled, and then nothing happened. My mind reeled in wonder as I assumed what game it was that we were playing, so I asked him. Donald was walking away from me, inviting my step behind his by looking backwards one time and beckoning. Come, turn this one too, he said. I walked up beside him and turned on the electric cooker. The sudden blast of a switch did not invite the heat of the kitchen that I always felt when mom cooked but I didn't think too much of it. When I had done as he asked, Donald smiled at me and grabbed my hands. Let's go outside, he said to me, and immediately we were on his march. I followed after him towards the door in a daze, unsure of what I was doing. Donald led me across the street with my hands firmly in his when a loud bang rocked the night. 
He then let go of my hand. It was the last time I would see my parents or Donald. I may be old, an ancient being to the youth of humanity, but by no means should I have to have been put through such vile, downright disgusting treatment in my final place of resting. Before the scythe comes to take me into the plane of reality beyond our own. My wife had died as of late 2022. Just last month, in fact, she had just turned 70, and we were celebrating with the whole family until all of a sudden, she dropped to the floor, hit her head on the side of the table, and we all watched in awe as her fragile skull split open like a chestnut in a microwave, and blood started pooling around the floor. Many in the family gained a horrific sense of PTSD, unlike that of any other, and the grandkids, they stayed home for weeks. The day they went, the first words they spoke to their classes was, Granny's head cracked open. The teachers sent them home instantly and told the parents that they would not return unless they stopped scaring the other children. As for myself, I could barely survive without her. We had come from an era where I would work and she would take care of the home, though society had moved on, and we had accepted that. Old habits die hard, and even in retirement, we seem content with this way of life. I was almost 80. I should have been the one to go first. She would have been okay. But as for myself, I was sent into a care home. We didn't have a whole lot of money left, and our pensions could barely cover the cost of living anyhow under the economic crisis we're hammered with today. This left me with a rather shoddy care home, with its reviews quite literally privatized so people couldn't see how awful the place really was. I detested the fact that I was being sent to one, but I feared my family's hatred of me for bearing my failure to look after myself on them. So I obliged, and less than a month ago, I was wheeled in to begin the final few steps of my life. The very first day I was there, I was greeted with a lovely smile from all the carers that worked there. I felt strange at the unexpectedly joyous greeting and was shown to my room after being told all their names and positions. My room met my expectations far more. It was a barren wasteland containing a minute bed, a single sheet covering, and a brick of a pillow. The walls were no different. Whilst they spoke about the luxury I was to partake in here, I gently knocked on the walls. They were paper thin. Next to my bed, the only other item in the room was a table, with one singular drawer under it, probably so they knew exactly where everything I owned was kept. It should have alerted me to what their detestable scheme was, but I was blind in realizing it until it was unstoppable. The first night mirrored the day. The dinner was excellent, a true fable of what this place was. We were gourds with plenty of meat, Vegetables, warm drinks, all sat around one table as we stuffed our faces. There was something unnatural about it all. However, by the time I was back in my room, falling asleep on my rock of a bed, I suddenly began to feel my stomach curdle. My insides felt like a complete mess, and the next day, I was considerably low on energy after the night of restless slumber. Yet for the entire week, every single night we would be fed a feast, and we would eat that feast leaving nothing to spare. The contents within the food were absurd for such an elderly audience, but as I said, there was something unnatural in the atmosphere. The staff even seemed to take glee in watching us smother our stomachs in the grease of the food. They all seemed to smirk as we finished. Each night, I would go back to my room lying on the same bed, feeling tighter and tighter strains grip my insides squeezing them with such an immense passion that it created a storm of pain that swirled about with the acid of my stomach and the overly saturated kidneys. They were on the brink of destruction. Once the first week had ended, we were cut off from our nightly feasts. They started filling us with black coffee. No milk, only caffeine. For dinner, we were treated with bread and then dessert. Several enormous bars of chocolate 
My kidneys were struggling to cope with the immense pressure from all the fat, caffeine, starch that engulfed my entire body night after night. Then, on a cold winter's night, I crept out of my room, fed up with staying put as my stomach fought the urge to implode. I snuck my way past the vast expanses of the corridors and hallways, eventually walking past a room with a padded metal door, yet the walls beside it stood paper thin, exactly as every other room had in this godforsaken place. We've almost finished with this lot. One more week of coffee and chocolate. Then we'll take it all away. A raspy voice came deep within, and I was taken aback by the sudden reveal of their intent to starve us. That won't work, sir. To truly annihilate them from the inside, we should increase the strain on their bodies to cope with such a vast quantity of food. You give a pig an elephant, and if it's hungry enough, the pig will eat until satisfaction. But humans, humans don't have a boundary for satisfaction. These wrinkly pigs are gonna eat themselves to the grave, and we will be there to collect the spoils. Fine, we'll continue to feed them, but when one dies, so do the rest. You understand? I felt the employee nod, then suddenly I felt his footsteps face towards the door, and he started walking towards it. Before I could take in what I just heard, a loud crash came from behind. I suddenly felt my body collapse to the floor, my head slamming against it, and before I could shut my eyes in agony, I looked up. There was a staff member holding a bloody metal pole in one hand, and his other grabbing my leg and pulling me away. I woke up startled. I was in some kind of cheap hospital room, with all the same staff members standing in front of me, with two other men beside him. You, you have a kidney stone, sir. The man on the left spoke in a raspy undertone. Uh, oh my, I thought it was him. Yes, yes, kidney stones need instant treatment or they cause the body to shut down and die. Now, how awful would that be, sir? He leant over me and started dragging the pillow away from under my head. I felt paralyzed and the only body part I could move was my eyes. Ah, such a shame. He was found unconscious in his bed just an hour ago. I guess that means he's probably already dead, or at least close enough to it. Put the man out of his misery, John. John then took the pillow and walked over to me. This is what happens when you don't follow the rules. Now sleep tight. Your kidney just exploded. He then forced the pillow down on my face. I felt flashing colors consume my sight as I could make no attempt to struggle and instead had to endure the inability to breathe. My memories flashed in by seconds. I could feel every single thought, word, sound, all explode in my head at once. Until after a minute, it all went silent. He's dead, John, reported back to the main office. We will do the same to the rest shortly. They've all had a bit too much to eat. And with that, they all left. As for me, I'm still alive, breathing, but not for long. This place and its people would kill me sooner than later. It doesn't bother me, though. I can't wait to reunite once again with the love of my life. My name is Gwen, and I'm 25 years old. I work as an office secretary, which is enough for me to make a decent living, but my dream was always to become a professional singer. Yes, I know, the cliché. Nevertheless, music was always my passion. I don't just sing in the shower. I have performed live, singing with a few bands in local music festivals. Nothing too serious, including the symbolic paychecks, but it was enough for me to know that I had something going on. I also started posting songs and videos of me singing on social media, and the feedback was decent enough, and the viewers were slowly climbing with each post. But I needed to improve the quality of my videos, so I decided that I needed a better microphone. I wanted the best that money could buy, and so 
Knowing that the microphone was easy to keep, I decided to try and find a used one on Craigslist. There were a decent amount of options, and after a careful search, I found a model that was great, and the price was very appealing too. I contacted the seller. He was very nice and we arranged a meeting for the next day in the parking lot of a place right down the road. I will be wearing a Nirvana t-shirt and blue jeans. I am tall and have short blonde hair. Of course, I will be out of my car holding the package and the microphone. You can't miss me. My name is Bart, by the way. He said, Okay, I'll meet you there. My name is Gwen. Um, how about 6 p.m.? Is that fine for you? I asked. Yeah, 6 is good. I'll see you by tomorrow. Bye. Bart confirmed. The next day, when I arrived, 10 minutes after 6, I immediately saw Bart, fitting his own description. I waved and walked towards him. He smiled and started to take the microphone from the box to show me. And I assumed I thought that this was a good sign. Hey, Gwen. Uh, so here it is. As you can see, I still have the original box and the microphone is in perfect condition, I can assure you, Bart said. The microphone really seemed to be well taken care of. You never know before you test it, but I decided to take Bart's word on it. Thanks. Uh, here's the money. I'll see you around, Bart, I said, trying to look cool. He was ten years older than me, had tattoos, and I assume he had experience in the music business. As a confirmation before I departed, he asked, Are you a singer? I recently started a new band with young musicians that are taking their first steps, and we talked about trying to work with a female vocalist. We're just exchanging different ideas for now and playing some covers. Pop and rock that everyone knows from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, Bart said. Well, I'm an amateur singer, yeah. Um, I do have a bit of experience performing live, and I also have songs of mine and covers uploaded on the internet, I replied. Good. Uh, well, if you want to try out and come to rehearsal, you already have my number. This is the studio where our rehearsals are taking place, Bart said as he gave me his card from that of a music studio. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. I'll think about it and I'll give you a call if I'm interested, I said. Sure. Enjoy the microphone, Bart replied before getting back into his car and driving away. I returned home by foot, anxious to try out my new used microphone. It was working perfectly. I spent a couple of hours recording vocals. Happy with the results, this also gave me the adrenaline rush to accept Bart's proposal, to be a part of his band. I thought that the fact that it was a starting project, that this meant that I could influence the band's sound and even bring in a couple of original songs that I started composing my own. The next day, I called Bart and said I would be happy to join his band. That's great news, Gwen. Our rehearsal will be tomorrow at 9. Are you available? Bart asked. Yeah, I am. Uh, that's a good hour. I'll be there. I still have the card from the studio with the address, I replied. Excellent. We'll see you tomorrow. And so we did. That Thursday night, I was there at the noisy, silent studios, rehearsing with my new band. Douglas was playing the bass, Monica on the drums, and Bart himself was playing the guitar. The rehearsal was going great. I thought we were sounding good for musicians who were just taking their first steps playing together. We fooled around by jamming some hits, from Michael Jackson to Audio Slave. Then, when we were finally done for the night, around 11.30, Bart started to pass a and Douglas had brought a few beers. I'm usually not much of a drinker, and even less of a smoker, but I had tried them before, and I was excited to do it with my new band and hopefully new friends, so I couldn't say no. We were all just sitting on the floor inside the rehearsal room chatting, smoking and drinking. But after a few moments, I started to feel dizzy, which was strange because the stuff didn't seem to be strong. Although the beer did have a funny taste, but I thought it was just the brand, a kind that I'd never tried before. I noticed that Monica seemed to be falling asleep as well. Suddenly, I passed out. When I woke up, I saw the nightmare that was awaiting me. Bart was sitting very close to me, 
his one hand inside my top, and my bra was unhooked. He seemed to be surprised to see my eyes looking at him. I was disgusted, scared, and angry, all at the same time. Taking advantage of Bart's surprise, I managed to push him aside. We were still inside the rehearsal room. I stood up, still in shock and dazed. I was able to see that Douglas was doing the same thing to Monica. He started to look at me, his eyes wide open and saliva dropping from his dirty mouth. Sadly, Monica was still knocked out and wasn't aware of what was happening to her. As I bolted out, fortunately there was a police car parked nearby the studio. I alerted them. Both Bart and Douglas were arrested. It didn't take long for them to confess, knowing they had no other way out. Their plan was to drug me and Monica, not with the joint, but by putting acid in our beers. Me and Monica were never supposed to know about the ordeal. Fortunately for me, my beer wasn't contaminated enough, and so I was able to wake up from that living nightmare. Me and Monica became friends and are supporting each other in order to be able to deal with the trauma that we went through. We are actually making music together, but we only play with other women now. I smashed a microphone that I bought from Bart and got another one, this time brand new. As for Bart and Douglas, they got off easy. I'm sure it wasn't the first time that they did such a crappy thing. They must have been serial offenders. Perhaps our country needs stricter laws for crimes against women. I always had the sense that there was something strange about old Mr. Rogers' death. He was old, about 83 years old, and from the atmosphere at his funeral, it was evident that he lived a full life, even though he lived alone for most of his older days. He had friends, and I was one of his younger friends during his old days. Old Mr. Rogers was my neighbor, and he was a good neighbor. He concerned himself with the business of his plants. He maintained and groomed a small batch of tomatoes in a bucket, which he grew with such tenderness and care. I would tease him sometimes about his plants, and he would simply laugh it off in his usual way. He loved his plants like he loved his family, and he never seemed to bother anyone. At least, not that I knew of, because he lived alone, and I lived next door. He was not so springy, but he could carry himself just fine. Then, he was dead. It was strange. But that was last month. It was strange for two reasons. Our apartment was old, and there hadn't been anyone else other than the three of us neighbors in the apartment, and all three of us lived alone. It was Matt, who owned a cat, and that was the only thing he talked to and loved. Old Mr. Roger, who owned the plant and gave all his affection and time to. Then there was me, the girl, who loved my job because I didn't know what to do with my neighbors. The rest of my building, about the three apartments, were unoccupied. The first strange thing about the incident was that it was first labeled a murder. Matt was always quiet, but his cat had been quiet for a few days before Mr. Old Roger's death, and I discovered that he had left a note in the mailbox that he would travel to his mom in the south, and it had been Old Mr. Rogers and myself in the building. No one knew that, so Matt and I had been suspected but I had an alibi and CCTV footage at work that cleared me off my charges. Matt's mom and his alibi checked out from the south when she was reached. Then the police declared that there was no foul play and it was ruled a suicide. The second strange thing was just how quickly the police turned it around, saying that he killed himself. He loved his plants too much. The case plagued my mind and I often thought about it when I was at work at the local coffee shop and when I was home alone in the building. Sometimes I would lay in bed and wonder why. There was no objective motives. We cannot understand why a person would kill. It's subjective, and until a killer is brought in, we cannot say why they did it. The sheriff said to me when they had been cleared, it's like thunder. These things occur. It would be a shame if thunder struck at the same spot twice. I didn't think about the words too much during the day, but at night, I had such vivid recollections of everything that occurred. 
I suffered the silence of the night to linger when I reminisced the sound of old Mr. Roger going about his day watering his tomatoes. Last night was one such night. The thought of old Mr. Rogers kept me up for significant parts of the night, and I stayed up on my phone as I thought about it more, almost conjuring the sweeping feeling of his presence in my mind that I began to hear the pattern of foot drops in my head. I shrugged it off and continued on my phone. I tapped the screen and it revealed that it was late at night. 2 a.m. God, I'll be damned. I scoffed, mentally distracted. Unmistakable foot drops. My body turned rigid and my blood pumped cold, causing my heart to snap. The heat of my breath burned on my upper lip and my head banged. The cascading down of sensations made me numb for seconds and in my hay numbness, I heard the noise of marching ever more clearly. I rolled over in my bed as the noise moved closer. I had the better mind to run for the door, but I decided against it. My mind was so dizzy with thoughts, and I instinctively ducked underneath my bed when a key clicked into my door. I pressed my hand over my mouth, smothering the heaves of panic that escaped my lips. The pores of my face and body poured forth with release. I soaked up the sweat with my own dread as the door yawned open. Fucking bitch. The voice growled as it scanned the room to find my absence. He watched for a bit, hesitant to move further. And as though suddenly, the legs moved towards my bed with fury. It was a man I identified. Where could she have gone? He threw a tantrum briefly and stood up from the bed. Then, he picked up himself with a throwing heave as he stepped back towards the door. He held it slightly ajar and started to laugh. Cindy Logan, I know you're in this room. I can smell you, he said. My life dashed before my eyes, and the moment of horror made my stomach tighten. I felt the pressure of life around my throat and I suffocated from fear. In the chaos of my mind, I tried to make sense of the voice, and when the first thought struck me, I gasped. Gotcha. It was the sheriff. He turned away from the door and started to saunter towards me with a reckless fury. I had begun to whimper underneath the bed, scared for the worst to happen. I shut my eyes and said in a hurried prayer for help, my lips were still quivering when I heard a loud bang from the door. It was a noise, so sharp it rocked the room. The gun clicked a second time, and the bang rocked again. The sheriff fell onto the bed, and his dead weight made the bed frame creak. I squealed. Come out, Cindy. He's dead. The one who had shot him in the deep reverberating bass was the voice familiar to me. It was Matt. Matt? I called out for another bed, realizing myself that I had been snotty and sobbing. Matt had never spoken to me. That was payback for killing my cat and Mr. Old Roger, Matt said as I crawled out from under the bed. Matt stepped into the bedroom. When he killed my cat, I was distraught. Then I saw him kill Mr. Old Roger. No one would believe them if I told him who killed Mr. Roger. But I knew you would believe me when he came for you. I huffed in frustration as I stood outside the club waiting for my Uber to come pick me up. My makeup was smudged as I ran ahead through my auburn hair. I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket and pulled it out to see that it was a text from my boyfriend, Nate. Sorry, Rebecca, I swear it wasn't what it looked like. She was the one who tried to touch me, not the- I didn't finish reading the message as I shoved the phone into my pocket. I was beyond angry, and I was past the point of being persuaded. I furrowed my eyebrows as I realized that my Uber was already 15 minutes late. It should have been here, since I was shivering slightly in my flimsy dress, and I was about to reach into my pocket to check my driver's location when a car pulled up in front of me. I watched as the tinted windows of the front seat were pulled down. 
Are you Rebecca? He asked, and I nodded my head. I usually check the plate number, but it was already late, and I just needed to get out of there. I noticed his phone on the console had the GPS turned on, and I sighed in relief. He stepped out of the car just as I was about to pull it open. Let me, he said, and I smiled, realizing that chivalry wasn't dead after all. He pulled open the door, and my eyes widened at the sight. I had no time to react as he pushed me into the back seat. I was disoriented for a moment as I fell on top of something hard before I heard the door slam shut behind me. I opened my eyes to see what it was. I let out a scream of terror from my lips at the sight of the soulless eyes of a man staring back at me. I scrambled away from him, taking in his caved-in chest. I reached for the handle of the door to yank it open when the driver's door was opened and the man sat down. He immediately locked the doors and I felt my body tremble in its spot. My eyes glanced toward the dead man beside me as I gulped, wondering if that was what would become of me soon. I watched as we made our way out of the city and I felt my hope dwindling down. My body was tossed around on the seat and I ended up falling on top of the corpse. I screamed when I heard the man gasp as his eyes came back to life. I scrambled off him and watched as he panicked and began to breathe heavily. What the hell's going on? Who are you? He yelled. Abruptly, the car came to a stop as I pressed my body firmly against the car door. I watched as the driver stepped out of the front seat and exited the car before slamming the door shut. I looked around frantically for a weapon to arm myself with as I felt my tears stain my cheeks. He yanked the car door open as the other man stared at me fearfully. He tried to scramble toward me, but instead, the driver grabbed a hold of his shirt and pulled him out of the car. You're supposed to be dead, he roared. I watched as he pulled out a Swiss blade from his pocket and plunged it into the man's stomach. I screamed in fear as I heard the man's horrifying cries as he was stabbed over and over again. After a minute, the cries stopped. I dared to open my eyes only to see the driver looking at me. His soulless eyes stared at me for a while before he said, You stay here. I did not move. There was nowhere for me to go even if I wanted to. I watched as he slammed the door shut before moving to the back of the car and opening the boot. I watched as he retrieved a shovel. My body trembled at the realization of what he intended to do. What were the chances that he would dig two graves and put me in the second? I watched as he pulled the corpse off the ground and moved to the front of the car before dropping it once more. For several moments he dug a hole as I lay immobilized with fear and watched as he buried the man. When he was done, he turned toward me with a wicked smile as he began moving back towards the car. I shook my head profusely as he approached me, but there was no point as he pulled the door open. He pulled me by my feet toward him, and I reached out to pound my fist against his chest, struggling to get away. Stay still, he spat, and I watched as he pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket. I felt tears prick my eyes at the realization of what he was about to do as I shook my head profusely. He only gave me a wicked grin as he placed the handkerchief against my nose. Immediately, I was hit by the smell of chloroform, and my vision became blurry. Say nighty-night, he said with a grin before everything went dark. I woke up with a pounding headache as I took a moment to compose myself. My eyes shot open as I remembered exactly what was going on, only to be met with darkness. A foul smell similar to the stench of a rotting corpse was thick in the air. And that was when I felt the hard surface below me. I opened my mouth to scream, but I found myself unable to do so with my mouth gagged. I tried to move, but my hands and feet were firmly bound. I was trapped in a confined space, and from the sound of the engine I could tell I was still in the car, which meant I was in the trunk. My heart thudded rapidly against my chest as we continued to travel for what felt like hours. Suddenly, the car came to a stop, and I held my breath as I heard him make his way out of the car. I was left frozen in my spot as I heard him approach the back of the vehicle. He pulled open the trunk, and I was met with the face of the devil. I trembled as I let out a muffled scream against the rag in my mouth. No one can hear you now, he hissed, as he grabbed my arm and shoved me out of the car. I landed on the ground with a thud as I caught sight of the corpse in the trunk. 
I let out another scream as a shudder of fear ran down my spine. I glanced my eyes around and found that we were in the middle of the woods and the surroundings were dark. I lay on the ground as I watched him pull another body out of the trunk and place it outside. He went back to the back seat and retrieved the shovel as I watched him begin to dig the hole. The entire time I was left staring at a corpse with a slit throat beside me. Moments later, the driver returned as he pulled the corpse away. I could hear shuffling behind me as I listened to him grunt and moan as he buried the body. Slowly, he made his way back towards me as he came to a stop. He placed his hand to his lips as though to shush me as he slowly pulled the cloth from my mouth. I'm going to untie you now, he said slowly. I nodded my head as he cut the rope from my hands and moved to my feet, doing the same with his Swiss blade. The moment my feet were free, I let out a blood-curdling scream, and he was in front of me in an instant. He wrapped his hand around my neck, cutting off my airflow. I told you to shut up, but you people never listen, do you? It was that moment when I thought I would die because of the fear and the panic whirling through my body and mind. The last thing I heard before passing out was the sounds of the wailing sirens in the distance. The cops saved me that. Sometimes I still wonder who that man was and who were the people he killed. It's funny and scary at the same time that the cops never answered my questions and told me to stay mum and move on with my life. <laughs> As if it was that easy.